Its journey through space is over. NASA's Mars Science Laboratory is ready to take planetary science to a whole new level. Curiosity is fully operational on the surface of Mars. Discover how NASA's latest rover will explore this next great scientific frontier. Edge. An inside and outside look at all things NASA. We are live in the Piazza in Media City, UK, in Salford. Yes, and we're also live on 22 screens all around the United Kingdom, thanks to the BBC. Welcome everyone to our live coverage of the MSL landing. And we'd like to thank all of the people who have come out here to Media City, UK, who woke up early with us to join us for our uh, broadcast this morning. Pre breakfast. Pre breakfast. Uh, well, this is such a great event. Absolutely. Uh, in about a half hour or so, Curiosity will be landing on Mars, a very historic occasion. And then also, besides talking about MSL and the Mars rover Curiosity, we're also going to be talking about ExoMars a little bit later in the broadcast. And we'll also be going back and forth to JPL as things sort of unfold right. and develop throughout the course of events today. Uh, they are providing obvious coverage at Mission Control, and we want to keep a prize of that and uh, keep up to date as things are going. Hey, okay. It's traveling over 8,000 miles an hour right now. It's <laughs> Olympic speed. Uh, I mean, faster you know, than Hussein Bolt. <laughs> yeah, it's so like 300 <laughs> times faster than Hussein Bolt uh, did yesterday in the 100 meters. I, I'm sorry, I'm a bit distracted because you're holding uh, a piece of Mars. Uh, tell us about this piece of Mars. It's a bit of a meteorite that's come from Mars. So we already have Mars rocks. These come to Earth when an asteroid hits the surface of Mars and breaks bits off and they just fall completely at random on Earth. We know they're from Mars. That, you know, that was my next, that was question. Your next question. She could see it forming in my <laughs> head. Yes. I know it's from Mars because it's got gas trapped in it. And oh. when you heat up the rock, you get the gas out. And the gas has got the same composition as Mars's atmosphere. So it's got carbon dioxide so and, and, and argon and, and other things, which are exactly the same as Mars's atmosphere. It was a real detective story. I was going to say, it sounds like a detective situation, where it's almost like you're looking for Mars fingerprints. Uh, on. And that's found by gases, huh? Yep, that's absolutely right. I mean, uh, if we look at, at the Earth and we think about the Earth and what's in its atmosphere, we know it's about four-fifths nitrogen and about one-fifth oxygen. And that's how we can live here. And the pressure of the atmosphere is 1,000 millibars. We, we know that one from the weather forecast and stuff like that. But on Mars, it's very different. It's only six millibars, so six thousandths of the pressure of Earth's atmosphere. And it's practically all carbon dioxide. So nobody could stand on the surface of Mars and live there. A human couldn't. Now, that's got to be rare, right? You're sure. holding a, a very rare artifact. I'm nervous being in this proximity to something so valuable. Oh, are you talking about me or the rock? Both. <laughs> I'm here with uh, Hugh Perryman from Manchester. Uh, what's your question, Hugh? Um, what is the significance of the Gale crater where, where it's landing? Well, of course, the selection of the landing site was critical. And they came up with a number of great uh, potential candidates, and Gale crater won out. Gale crater is uh, just south of the Martian equator, and it's, it's a very low-altitude crater. It has some very interesting properties. Well, being low-altitude, you know, water runs downhill, so perhaps there's a chance that water once stood in Gale Crater. We believe there are clays on the uh, base of the crater, and there's a large mountain that looks like it's made of uh, different sediments right in the middle of the crater. It's a fascinating place uh, to explore. We have a question here from Twitter. Why isn't MSL using airbags like other missions? It's difficult to go to Mars, and we've had a few failures. And it was thought that uh, using airbags to cover the rovers that we send to Mars and kind of let them bounce until they settle on the surface of Mars was a pretty low risk, pretty good idea, pretty good way to send rovers to Mars. But Curiosity is just too big. This thing weighs a metric ton, and it's too big to put bags around. 
So they've adopted this very intricate method of landing with many multiple steps that occur automatically and must occur in proper order and proper sequence for it to make it to the ground. We're going to go back to the actual animation of MSL as it enters the Martian atmosphere. And this theoretically happened minutes ago on Mars in the at Martian atmosphere. So. See what happens is with that 14 minute delay, are we really here or is it 14 minutes past? Yeah, I, the future? Don't get me on time <laughs> travel because I'll get wrapped around the axle and it'll be bad news for everybody. No, we don't want to do that. <laughs> and we have the guidance and navigation control. It's steering the spacecraft, entering the Martian atmosphere. And interestingly enough, Medley is actually getting important engineering data from the entry. Yeah, this is the first time we're actually going to be getting important scientific data inside the heat shield, and we're going to be studying about the Mars atmosphere. And those measurements are being taken through Medley until the uh, heat shield is discarded. Any time now. Mm -hmm. And then with the parachute, and it slows it down to below sub supersonic speed, that's the largest parachute ever to be used on a planetary surface. And weighs just about uh, 100 pounds. Yeah. And then once we collect all that data from the Medley instrument, which is, stands for Mars Science Laboratory, MSL, Entry, Descent, and Landing Instrumentation Unit, that data is going to be transferred to the rover and then the heat shield jettisons. Yep. And then, of course, a very dramatic, probably one of the most complex things designed for this mission is the sky crane, which we've never done anything like this ever, actually deploying a rover from a hovering sky crane. Now looking at this, this is the type of stuff sci-fi movies are made of. That's right. You know, when you look at this animation, it's just mind-blowing. That's pre-Star Wars. Yeah, like Jawas are like, they're, they're, they're feasting on this. They're, they're ready to take this into their sand crawler and, uh, you know. So. But, but it's just hard to fathom that we're looking at a, essentially a Mini Cooper <laughs> falling down yeah. to the surface of, of, of Mars. Uh, well, falling? Uh, sky craning down. Yeah, sky craning yes. down. Touchdown confirmed. We're safe on Mars. Yeah. Touchdown. Yeah. All right. Yes. <laughs> Look great. at that. Yeah. Awesome. Live from Media City, UK in Salford, we have touchdown. And across the United Kingdom, people are seeing the joyous reactions of the team out of JPL all around NASA. It looks like we have had a successful landing of Curiosity. Wow. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, wow. So, so, so. Let the science begin. The first image that we get is going to be a very low resolution black and white image, so it may be very difficult to see on screen if it uh, comes through. And that's coming from one of the cameras on board, Curiosity. I, I'm just looking at these pictures and saying to myself, it worked. <laughs> <laughs> it worked. That, that sky crane. And for those of you out in the crowd on, on the piazza, what do you guys think? Yeah. And, and years from now, when uh, we're landing on Mars, you can tell all your family where you were the day the uh, Curiosity landed and made that possible, paved the way for that to happen. Just, it's great to see the enthusiasm of everyone out at JPL. And now we're beginning a, a new era of massive science coming from the surface of Mars. Absolutely. And over the course of the next several days and weeks, they're going to be turning on the instruments. We're getting a lot of feedback from Curiosity. And we'll begin the, the journey. Absolutely. And remember, it's not a sprint. This, this is, you know, we have the Olympics going on, and, and if you really want to pick a, an event, I would say it's a marathon, because it's going to be a, a, you know, a two-year mission, minimum. Curiosity's in, in it for the long haul. But to pick another uh, event, <laughs> gymnastics, uh, we can absolutely say that uh, Curiosity stuck the landing. Absolutely. That was a perfect 10, wasn't it? Yes, yeah. yes. perfect 10. Yes. I'm here with Kate from Manchester. What's your question, Kate? Uh, I'd like to know how long the power source stays live. Very good question. It's, it's an outstanding question. We had one set of landers on Mars, the Viking landers, that used a nuclear power source back in the 1970s. Since then, we've been using solar cells. But the Curiosity rover has a plutonium nuclear power source. And that power source is going to last for about one Martian year, which is uh, about two Earth years. 
Now that's, uh, it's actually called in, uh, on the technical terms an RTG, or radioisotope thermo thermal electric generator. Electric generator. Right. I like that word. Let's, we can say that again. Say, RTG. Say, say that it again. 10 times. Yes, yes. For Spirit and Opportunity back in early 2000s, it was only designed the last three months, but we still have opportunity still going now. Yeah, that's right. That's been a wonderful uh, addition to that mission. Spirit and Opportunity are using solar cells. And uh, so the thought was that eventually, there's a, Mars is a dusty environment. A dust would build up on the solar cells and make them not very useful after a while. But it looks like that dust is being swept off the cells by perhaps little dust devils or other atmospheric winds. And so they've been able to operate for quite some time. But the great thing about having an RTG on Curiosity is the fact that the power source will outlive much of all the actuators, the engineering mechanisms on the rover. Uh, they'll probably go first before the actual power source. Uh, hard to say. You know, we've uh, designed missions in the past uh, for a finite lifetime, and they've lasted well along their uh, design specs. A good example of that is Voyager. Uh, Voyager missions were initially targeted just to go to Jupiter and Saturn. Then they said, well, let's go on to Uranus and Neptune with Voyager 2. And now it's uh, an interstellar mission breaking through the, uh, the heliopause and uh, uh, moving off into uh, deep space. Quick question, what is the temperature on the dark side of Mars? Well, you know, Mars, like the Earth, has an atmosphere. It's a thin atmosphere, but it has an atmosphere to spread heat, and it rotates just like the Earth does. In fact, its day isn't that much longer than an Earth day. So nighttime temperatures can get down to minus 100 centigrade, minus 120 centigrade, something like that. It's awfully, awfully cold. It's an interesting planet because it's so much like Earth in so many ways, and it's so different from Earth in so many ways. That was ways. one of the questions we had. We said, how is Mars like Earth? There you go. Okay, well, it, uh, um, let's see. Mars is a terrestrial planet. It's got a hard surface, uh, like Mercury, Venus, uh, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, the terrestrial planets. They all have hard surfaces. They're relatively small. They're relatively dense, something on the order of five grams per cubic centimeter, all about the same density. They all have atmospheres. Mercury, not so much, but a little bit. And uh, they're all relatively near the sun. Mars is about half the size of Earth. It has evidence of volcanism, has the tallest mountain in the world, Olympus Mons, an extinct volcano in the Tharsis region. It has polar caps, like the Earth does, but unlike Earth, its polar caps are both water ice and carbon dioxide ice. It has evidence of water flows and probably oceans maybe in the northern hemisphere a long time ago in its early formation. Mars once had a magnetic field like the Earth does, but it looks like it lost that field and that opened its atmosphere up to erosion from the solar wind and that and other processes, uh, collisions from space and so on, resulted in a much thinner atmosphere and a much colder surface. So those are some of the ways that uh, Mars is like the Earth and different from the Earth. Will Curiosity be analyzing rocks and soil? Oh, absolutely. I mean, that's one of its primary uh, functions on Mars. It is a geology laboratory uh, sitting there doing all of this analysis, uh, a lot of it uh, automatically. It's going to be able to come up close to a rock, just like the uh, MER rovers, and analyze the rock that way. It can look at rocks from far back. It can scoop up soil and put it in analysis containers for spectroscopy to tell what minerals are in the soil. Is there water? Are there water-bearing compounds? Is there organic life in the soil that might link to possibilities for life, that kind of thing? This particular rover is not detecting life. It's detecting the habitability that maybe once life existed or still exist. That's exactly right. Could life have lived in an environment like Mars in the past? Uh, are there habitable areas currently, maybe under the surface? Could we find water? In other words, evidence of habitability. That's what it's really looking for. Because ultimately, the, I think the big question you know, for our viewing audience, even here in, in the Piazza, is, is there life on Mars? I think everyone wants to know that question, and hopefully one day we'll be able to answer that. Uh, that's right, and uh, maybe ExoMars uh, will help us, as well as future missions. Let's talk about ExoMars. Now, that's the mission you guys are working for to, uh, to go to Mars. Tell me, what is ExoMars? ExoMars is a, a mission that's uh, formed from two parts. Firstly, there'll be an orbiter that's due to go up in 2016, um, and that will also be used as a data relay for the rover, which will be launched in 2018. 
Is, is that similar to Odyssey, how Odyssey helped us complete communications? That's absolutely right. And, and then, so that'll deploy, and then ExoMars has a rover as well. That's right. The 2016 mission first, though, needs to demonstrate the uh, entry, descent, and landing system. Um, it's a practice, if you like, for the, the rover itself. And then, once we've got all the data back from instruments on there, we'll be able to verify the, the final performance of the rover descent, and then hopefully we'll get all the data back from the instruments on that rover as well. well I'm, I'm very curious, what does EXO stand for? So I think the reason they've called it ExoMars is because this rover is an astrobiological mission. So what Curiosity will be able to tell us is how habitable Mars has been in the past, whether it's ever appropriate for life. And the next step after that, which is what the European Space Agency, the ESA mission, ExoMars will be able to do, is tell us if there are actually signs of life on the surface of Mars. So this field of science is called astrobiology or exobiology. So it's the ExoMars mission. So when you're watching the good news of Curiosity come back, you're <laughs> happy not just for the success, but you're actually going to be able to use that data to exactly. help your future mission. No, exactly. We're, we're both very, very excited about this mission and, and the, the science it's going to send back. So we, we've seen what the engineers have been able to pull off with that incredible entry and descent landing, the EDL, and now it's you know, kind of handing the baton onto the scientists to start doing these experiments and using all these incredible instruments to find out as much as we can about Mars. Obviously, uh, we've talked about MSL and Curiosity going to Gale Crater, um, and obviously they'll be sending that data back based on that region. Will you look for a similar region, or will you deliberately look for a different region of, of study? We'll, we'll be looking for a, a similar region. So the reason we went to Gale Crater with Curiosity it's because as far as we could tell from orbit, it, it was a wet place. An ancient primordial Mars, we think there was a lot of liquid water laying down all these minerals and, in fact, clays. There seems to be a lot of clays right in the base of this great big mountain in the middle of, um, of, this, of this crater, of Gale Crater. And on Earth, clays are only laid down in standing water, and life needs water. So it's, it's the signature for a habitable environment that might be there on primordial Mars. And with ExoMars, we want to go to a very similar environment. We want to find places where it seems to be in a, an aqueous, warm, wet environment, and then see if anything ever did get started there. Wow. And are there a lot of candidates like that? Uh, have you identified them? Where are you guys in the process for uh, picking a landing site? Well, I think we'll, we'll probably use some of the um, shortlist that was drawn up for Curiosity. So we've now mapped um, to very, very small scales a great deal of the surface of Mars. We know what its geography is like. And we've identified some of the most promising candidate sites. And Curiosity has gone to one of these most promising. And depending on what it finds, we, I mean, we might go to, to Gale Crater as well with, with ExoMars, or we might go somewhere else. We might do a follow-up mission and kind of land alongside it, perhaps. Now, can you imagine a tag team mission <laughs> in High Gale five Crater? On the surface yeah, that would be, be fantastic. <laughs> uh, but obviously, you make that decision not on the cool factor of being in close proximity, but based on how rich the area is for the science. Exactly, yeah. The other key point to make about the ExoMars mission is that the rover will carry a drill. So an exciting point is it'll be able to go down into the subsurface and extract samples for investigation. Because Mars doesn't have a uh, magnetic field like the Earth does. And as we've already seen, it has a very thin atmosphere. So there's a lot of space radiation beating down onto the surface of Mars. And this will break up any organic molecules, any signs of life um, that might, might remain there. So what you really want to do is get down beneath that surface layer that's been degraded and destroyed. And this ExoMars drill is about two meters long. Wow. Um, so it's, it's a good arm's length, in fact, longer than my arm, <laughs> delving right down to the surface, grabbing a handful of Martian soil, and then bringing that dirt back up to the surface to analyze and test and, and find stuff that might have survived a bit deeper. Lewis, you have yeah, a have couple pieces on my of knee. rock on your leg. <laughs> So one of, and one something, of, something's growing there, it looks like. We it's, have, yeah. So one of the earlier questions was, um, what preparation can you do before you go to Mars? And obviously, one of the things you want to do is test your equipment, your instruments, before you launch it to the Red Planet. So the samples I've got here are from Mars analog sites. They're samples of rock from some of the most Mars-like places on Earth. So we can study what the rocks there are like, or the survival mechanisms of, of organisms. Right. So on this rock, if I hold it up like that, you should be able to see this is some hard, kind of uh, granite-type rock. Now, is, is that microbes growing on there? Or These are lichens. So the lichen crustaceans, the bright orange crustaceans you can see here, uh, are lichen. They're actually quite an advanced life form. So this is an obvious thing to see with your eye, but we wouldn't actually expect anything as advanced and complex as this kind of lichen, this multicellular life that we have on this rock. And what we'd probably like to find, what we're hoping to find, it does look a bit more boring. If you can see right on the kind of inside edge 
of this rock. So you're looking at the kind of the side of the rock where it's broken over, open. Okay. And just under the surface, if you squint, you might be able to convince yourself you can see a thin band of green. So that's green mm -hmm. of, of chlorophyll, the, the molecule that allows plants and trees to photosynthesize and, and grow by sunlight. And there are microscopic cyanobacteria cells that have grown inside the rock themselves to, wow. to protect themselves in the outside environment and tinting it just green. And so what we would do um, with ExoMars is use much more sensitive equipment than just our eyes to analyze inside rocks like this by grinding them up and see what biosignatures, what signs of life we can find inside them. So you're working on an instrument for ExoMars called the Raman instrument? That's right. It's a Raman spectrometer, laser spectrometer that forms part of the analytical laboratory. So there are several instruments on ExoMars itself. There's an instrument on the drill, which illuminates the hole that the sample is extracted from and gets some initial information on the environment that the sample's been in. And then there are several other instruments that take images and look at the, the sample itself. And as I said before, it gets crushed into a powder and then passed to the analytical instrumentation. And the Raman spectrometer is one of those. It incorporates a laser. You shine the laser onto the sample. And then the light that comes back gives you information on the molecular composition. So you can determine what the sample is made from and hopefully detect any biosignatures or signatures that indicate the presence of past or present life. From my understand, this rover will be about the size of uh, Spirit and Opportunity? That's right, yeah. Okay. And it's using solar power? Yeah. You can imagine all the technical challenges here, getting the drill in place to extract the sample, then to crush it without anything getting jammed, and then to pass it around all the individual instruments and get results from each one of those. Well, that's a good point. You know, coming back, looking at the drill, because you, you want to be able to take a core sample. I mean, the ground has to be soft enough. You don't want to land on a surface where it's going to be so hard, where it's going to be so hard to drill yeah. one to two meters deep. And you take that into consideration when you're looking at the landing site. Yeah, absolutely. Selection of the landing right. site, and the rover also inc incorporates a radar, an instrument called Wisdom, and they collect, use all the different data from the instruments to determine an appropriate place to look for samples. I just think it'd be kind of cool if you actually had some of, you had some of these uh, rovers actually meeting up one day. You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, one of the plans going, so. for ExoMars was to, to land it as a twin mission, to have two rovers landing the same site and, and doing tag team science, having different instruments on board to build up the story together and right. kind of co uh, co collaborate. You can imagine think... the engineer's response to that <laughs> kind of suggestion. <laughs> That's a good point. They will collide in midair on it, the way down. It goes back to the science and engineers, scientists and engineers working hand in hand. Yeah. And we want to thank everyone who came out here today to uh, help us celebrate the arrival of Curiosity on Mars. Thank you to, to the mayor, uh, to the city of Salford, Media City UK, the BBC, everyone who made this uh, webcast possible. You are watching NASA Edge. An inside and outside look at all things Curiosity. <laughs> oh, even Have a great day. In there. That's nice.